What else are you going to eat then? Because you need protein, right? Mm -hmm. But it doesn't turn out that tofu has the same effect as the fish uh, uh, with the blood sugar. <laughs> so there's some factor that isn't clearly understood, but animal protein creates chronic inflammation. And uh, people who are mostly vegetarian have a much lower level of this inflammatory process. And there aren't too many people to study like this, but they have studied um, people groups like in Africa where their blood pressure actually goes down as they get older. So a 60-year-old in that country will have a blood pressure of like 110 without medicine. Because they don't eat uh, much animal protein. So that's, that's another factor. It's reversible. It's something we can control. And it, um, it has many other pronounced health benefits as well. So today I'm focusing on the sodium, but I think the backstory of what it is that affects blood pressure is much bigger than just a sodium and potassium. And if we just uh, focus on this part, that's important, but these other areas are, are also important and can have a, an additional benefit when we add all these different changes up. That's where our blood pressure can come down. Um, so by having lower blood sugars now after a meal, we're at lower risk for the chronic systolic hypertension. Because if after a meal, for one hour, we, have, we don't have this spike of blood sugars, um, the aorta is not going to get pickled by the glucose molecules mm -hmm. at the same rate as if we uh, ate a lot of protein with those carbohydrates and now we have this huge spike of, of the blood sugars. So, we're kind of taking it back a few steps. Uh, you're thinking, so the protein, in a sense, is the big factor that affects the blood sugars indirectly by affecting the blood glucose levels, which then affects the blood pressure. Any questions on that, or did I lose you? Okay. And exercise after me. Absolutely. There's another good, that brings down your blood sugar after a meal when the spike is the highest. Uh, a, a walk around the block several times is a very good way to bring down the blood sugars and avoid that spike by a very measurable amount. So then your aorta will love you because now it's not going to be pickled by the blood sugars. Okay. Get faded on me. Here we go. So if any of you want to re uh, read or listen to these videos a second time, if you have access to the internet, just put in the title on that website, the title on this page, when you visit nutritionfacts.org. You can watch this and any other videos and hear it a second or third time because it's kind of hard to always catch it all the first time. So, up here at the top, this is kind of the look of his website, and you just have the search term. You just type in the search thing, you put in the title, and the video will pop up, and you can watch it again. And even if, if you don't hear, you can still watch these videos because a lot of his information is graphical. You can read the transcript at the bottom of each video. Here's a... I'm just going to reduce it in size. Um, down here at the bottom of the screen, you click on the thing called View Transcript. And this is a sheet of... Um, that's where I get this from. Somebody has typed uh, what he spoke in the video and turned it into a transcript. Mm -hmm. So that way um, you can still learn from it even if you can't hear. <coughs> so late at night if you don't want to wake up your wife or husband, <laughs> you, you can still learn this stuff. All right, let's continue. There is a high sodium meal, which is to say a meal with a regular amount of salt most people eat, 
can impair arterial function within 30 minutes. Whereas potassium increases nitric oxide release, sodium reduces nitric oxide release. So the health of our arteries may be determined by our sodium to potassium ratio. Two slices of bacon worth of sodium in our arteries take a significant hit within 30 minutes. But add three bananas worth. So here he's got another chart. Some people in the back of the room might not be able to see the chart, so I'll just describe on the left side. And they're talking about a change in the FMD. Um, I don't remember what the acronym is for. Over time, he's showing that there's a decrease in the they wouldn't use so many short forms. So he's saying that by adding potassium, you can increase the um, amount of nitric oxide being uh, created, which affects your blood pressure. The nitric oxide is a chemical that the body uses to dilate <coughs> arteries. Uh, so it's dependent on how much of blood flow is going through there when it's going to slow the body and it senses it and opens the diameter of the artery by making more of this chemical. So should potassium just come from food or can it come from pills too? It could come from pills. Your body can't tell the difference because, uh, but the danger of it coming from pills is you may take more than you need. Mm -hmm. If you are not aware about how healthy your kidneys are, um, are Generally, in each day, our, our kidneys are controlling how much potassium is in our body by how much it dumps into our urine. And so if you have sick kidneys because they're failing, then it can't dump the excess potassium, and then you're in trouble because uh, high potassium levels are used for lethal injections. It, that, that's how they put down animals or people. So how much potassium should you take? It's... Um, Recommended like in a range of four grams okay. a day. But if uh, and you're in the ICU, what's the first thing a smart surgeon puts you on? Potassium. Yeah, they do. Every day you're losing a certain amount of potassium if you have normal renal function. If you usually in the ICU, you can think of they're not eating. Nobody eats in the ICU. No, no real food anyway. <laughs> if you are taking potassium, you want your blood levels. Yeah. So rather than to wait for the potassium to go low, which it will after like a week in the ICU, uh, the smart surgeons will start just bolus, uh, giving it to you in your IV at very low amounts, 40 milligrams is what they're putting in a liter of fluid. And that will run out for half a day. So you're not getting a lot, but it's enough to keep you out of trouble because the kidneys can hang on to everything but 10 milligrams a day. So you have to get at least 10 milligrams a day or your, your kidneys are taking it out of the cells in your body because each cell is storing potassium and if, if the blood levels drop then the cells are going to release the potassium into the blood to, to keep that ratio in a healthy range. Question. Go ahead. What, uh, I didn't quite understand what, the, what happens if you take too much the balance or the voltage across the cells is um, now messed up. It's not at the normal voltage. Uh, the voltage is used to drive chemical reactions in one direction or the other uh, across each cell. And uh, the one that bothers us or is of most concern with potassium is the pacemaker cells in our body. Um, we want them to keep pacing at the right rate. And uh, the heart cells are not going to be contracting at the rate they should be if there's too much potassium or too little. Both are lethal. They lead to arrhythmias. And, and, and then arrhythmias uh, that are life threatening, they, you can't recuperate from those. So be too many bananas are killed. No, I'm talking about supplements. Yeah. That. Usually, it's the supplements that get you in trouble if your kidneys are not working normally. 
Nobody has, has ever died of potassium overdose from eating too much food the way God created it. The problem is when you obtain the potassium in artificial ways, like um, these fake salts are 50% potassium and 50% sodium, that's fine for the average person who has normal kidney function. Now you're going to get an excess of sodium, of potassium, and your kidneys can just dump it without any problem. Um, and regulate the amount you need. So you're not going to get an excess of amount. But if you put that same amount into your uh, IV, it would be lethal. That's what they call lethal injection. Uh, it gives you an instant arrhythmia and your heart stops. But because it, if you eat it with food, it takes a little longer and your kidneys have enough time to dump it uh, into the urine and get rid of it so that the blood levels of the potassium don't rise to a dangerous level. And just to remember that um, if you're taking supplements, you're robbing your, your body of the fiber that you could be getting through food. So fiber is very important. It is. And, and so I'm not advocating you buy this fake salt that reduces your sodium level by replacing half of it with potassium. Uh, to a chemist, that sounds like a good deal because now you can just play with the amount and feel like you're not in trouble. Go ahead. What about PD light? Because I know some people <clears throat> who had migraines and they drink a little bottle of PD light and their migraines just disappear because it has all the potassium, magnesium, zinc, and sodium and all that in it. It does. The, the electrolytes in a drink like that are on the low side. Um, I think the biggest effect those people are experiencing is better hydration. I, I, I don't think that the electrolytes in there are dramatically shifting the electrolytes in our bloodstream. But if you can think of your blood as getting more concentrated if you're dehydrated, that's going to affect the potassium levels much more with the, just the dehydration that can take place with exercise or just forgetting to drink enough water. That's a bigger factor than the, the small amount of electrolytes that they add. They put in such small amounts so nobody can easily overdose on the amount of potassium by just chugging a gallon. So it's a fairly uh, safe drink that way. But uh, hydration is an important factor for headaches. So, so this, this chart is basically highlighting that uh, potassium and sodium both affect the amount of nitric oxide production in our body, which is a key regulator for uh, dilating the arteries. And, uh, it, uh, indirectly affects uh, blood pressure levels. So by having a, a better ratio, you're going to have more normal uh, blood pressure control. So everyone's supposed to be having higher levels of potassium in their diet compared to sodium levels every day. But the average American now is eating way more sodium uh, compared to the amount of potassium in their diet. So our goal is to find foods that can shift us in a better direction and uh, reducing the amount of foods that have an excess of the sodium to improve that ratio. Yeah, within 30 minutes. But add three bananas worth of potassium and you can counteract the effects of the sodium. When we evolved, we were eating 10 times more potassium than sodium. Now the ratio is reversed, more sodium than potassium. These kinds of studies provide additional evidence that increases in dietary potassium should be encouraged. <coughs> what does that mean? More beans, sweet potatoes, and beefy greens, which are like a super good double whammy, high in potassium and nitrates. This recommendation to eat spinach from the 900s, pretty impressive, though they also recommended bloodletting and abstaining from sex. So we should probably take ancient wisdom with a grain of salt, but our meals should be added salt free. So doctors have often recommended a low salt diet. But in terms of the big picture, uh, does such advice really have any value? Do, do people see huge changes? 
Well, one reason we don't is, is because we're, we're not always told to increase the potassium at the same time. So it's not just the amount of sodium that is the problem. We, we also having low sodium uh, potassium levels. So uh, dropping our sodium levels in half may still not improve that balance enough if we're just eating so little in the way of fruits and vegetables and dark leafy greens. These are not things that people uh, eat in abundance. So uh, that ratio is going to tip in the right direction only if we also eat the good sources of potassium in abundance. And so there are some people who have a genetic um, variation, so they hang on to sodium more than the average American. They usually have roots that come from Africa, where uh, losing sodium is like threatening, because if you're in a hot country, you sweat more, and those people that can hang on to their sweat, in other words, will hang on to the sodium that controls the sweat, um, they're not going to get as dehydrated as quickly. And so for them, that's an advantage on a hot day, if they don't have enough uh, electrolytes. In this country, that's a disadvantage because so many processed foods, packaged meats, they, the canned uh, vegetables, they, they come with an excess of sodium. And so people with that trait now are going to have uh, too much sodium that they're hanging out to. So I had a patient who was just in his 30s, lost both kidneys because of high blood pressure. You wouldn't feel the symptoms except the occasional headache. But when your blood pressure is close to 200, uh, month after month, uh, there are certain organs that will fail, and the kidneys are one of them. And, and so he, had, he was now forced to go into dialysis at such a young age. Uh, you don't know uh, ahead of time if you have that gene. It's, it's a smaller percentage of Americans that have that. And he was a, a black man. That tends to be the people who have it more, but you won't know if in your background you had that gene passed on to you. But if you go on a low salt or low sodium diet and you don't see a dramatic change, then you probably don't have that gene. And so you don't have that pronounced improvement in your blood pressure by just cutting back on the sodium. You still see some improvement for the average person. But the greater improvement will be if, if you change that ratio of sodium to potassium so that now you have much more sodium, potassium than you do the sodium. That ratio now will help your nitric oxide levels. Okay, so let's talk about some examples of where, where we get these from. This is just a website that I happen to scroll through. Health deliciousness. It just happens to be a nice pictorial way to see good sources of potassium. The amount of sodium in any of these sources are not zero, but they're way, way smaller. Uh, like uh, 10 times less than the potassium levels. So we, we should probably review what, what is a high source of sodium, which is not on this website. And, and then those are the foods we want to minimize. And then focus on the foods in this website. Pick the top 10. Add those to your meals more often as a good source of natural potassium. Uh, why is it better to eat it in this form than to use that fake salt? Well, there's a million chemicals in here that you're not getting that prevent all these other chronic diseases antioxidants, they don't come in that salt shaker. And so you're really cheating yourself. You're trying to get the potassium in an artificial way through a salt shaker. So any, any ideas of where our high sodium sources come from in the diet? Well, celery has high sodium. It does. Mm -hmm. but, but it, celery? Celery? Yeah. Mm -hmm. High salt? Sodium. When, when you look at all these natural sources, plants in our garden, they're, they're in proportion, they're on the low side of sodium. You're not going to consider that a high salt diet if that's all you ate. The, 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 for the average American, the foods that are loaded with sodium 
Uh, the food process. Process. Processed food. Any, any of the processed foods we're talking about, sausages, um, any, uh, the, the meats that have been added with flavoring. What is the major in flavoring that they're adding? It's salt. They're like the turkeys that have been injected. What's one of the main chemicals they're injecting in the turkey to tenderize them and make them taste better? It's the salt. And, and so sodium is, is found in, in uh, excess amounts. Because if, if they didn't add any of this, most meat uh, all has the same flavor without the salt. And the salt is what really helps bring out the flavors. So you could reduce the amount of servings, the size of the servings, or find protein sources that don't have that in there. There are alternatives, like uh, you get your protein from like peanut butter or tofu. Well, you'd have to go to a salt-free peanut butter. But there are different ways. Uh, let's say you buy a can of beans. <coughs> People don't like a can of beans with no salt. It's just very different flavor. So where is the sodium? Let's say you poured all the salt off. Have you poured all the sodium away by just pouring off the water that the beans came in? No. We've re re reduced some. Uh, uh, I wouldn't recommend drinking that water because it's salt water. Mm -hmm. But the salt is throughout every cell in the, in the beans. And why is that? Because um, it sits in there a while and, and may not be inside the cells when they first made it. But after it sits there a while, the salt gets into the cells completely. Can you taste that salt inside the cells? No. You only taste what's on the surface. So you're getting all this unnecessary sodium that's not on the surface of the of the bean that you can't even taste. So how do you how do you avoid that? You could uh, buy a salt-free can of beans and sprinkle it with a, a modest amount of salt afterwards. Now the salt is on the surface, not inside. And you're able to use a lot less sodium than if you just eat the can of beans the way they're prepared. So that's just a simple example of why canned vegetables are a high source of sodium, but you could reduce that without feeling like you're doing, you know. I'm not saying that's the final goal. Your taste buds can actually get used to a low salt diet. It takes time. Uh, you can like, sort of like weaning yourself off caffeine. It's something you can do slowly and then you don't feel the big shock to your system. But uh, if you haven't made that transition, um, somebody gives you something with no salt in the oatmeal or no salt in your vegetables, you find that you have to add a lot of something else, or, or it just tastes flat. Go ahead. Not like frozen vegetables. They, they don't add salt to them. Oh, they do. Some do. They, 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 some do. They, some, there's a lot of them that add salt to the frozen vegetables. Read, read, the, package. read the package. The package will tell you. Okay. I mean, it's probably sprinkled on top, and then it's frozen. But it's not going to be like it's getting into the cells unless they cook it in salt water for a long time. And it's not as much as in the cans, but it's still there. Yeah. So that's a better choice. You can actually get the salt-free cans. They haven't added um, any salt on some of those. It's only because some doctors are telling the patients you have to eat a low salt diet because of heart failure or kidney failure. Or cook them from scratch. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, if you cook them from scratch, you're not going to have to worry about the salt. You have control over how much you put mm -hmm. on the outside of it. So that's, those are good recommendations. Okay, we're going to run out of time, so I'll go quick. Here are some good sources of potassium. Beet greens. So this falls into the dark leafy green. So if you can't remember all the examples, just think, is this a dark leafy green? Well, beets, beet leaves will fall in that category. Yams are a higher source than the white potatoes, or whatever other potatoes there are. Sweet potatoes. Sweet potatoes are yams. So the potatoes are a good source. The yams happen to be higher than the regular potatoes. So we're talking about 800 milligrams for a serving compared to like 500 for a regular potato. Garden cress, it's a dark leafy green, 600 milligrams. Lima beans, anything in the bean family is a... I'm not, me and my boy don't like lima beans. 
and those who are really, really hungry. But there's so many other good forms of beans that you will like. And of course spinach, 558 milligrams. So if our goal is to get to, let's say, 4 grams, which is 4,000 milligrams, uh, this will get you in that step, uh, in that direction, a lot faster. For the average American, one of the highest sources of potassium, uh, no, of salt, is, is bread. Because we eat a lot of bread. And they actually add quite a bit of salt to the bread. Here's twist chart, another dark leafy green. 549 milligrams of potassium. Here's the big potato, around 535 milligrams for the regular potato. <coughs> Bamboo shoots, you'd find those like in Chinese or Thai food. Yeah, you can buy them in a can uh, if you don't have them fresh. 533 milligrams. Kale, another dark, dark leafy green. 491 milligrams. And here's that's a, so here's sweet potato. I thought yams and sweet potatoes are the thing. No, not. No, very different. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We do not have yams in America. Okay. They can't grow them and they can't ship them. Okay. Whatever. So whatever I said about yams, um, mm -hmm. they're, they're different than sweet potatoes. <laughs> sweet potatoes are almost like regular potatoes. They have 475 milligrams. The yams that they eat in other countries have uh, closer to 800. Mm. So, but still, it's a good source when you compare it to like bananas. Are red potatoes compared to sweet potatoes? They're similar. More or less? Yeah, almost the same. Mushrooms, 448 milligrams. So when you eat these foods, you realize you're doing yourself a lot more good. Jerusalem artichokes, 429 milligrams. Fennel. And Brussels sprouts, another dark leafy green. Looks different than your regular salad items, but uh, anytime you see something dark and leafy, it's going to be a good source of potassium. 398 milligrams. Parsnips. Here's another Chinese cabbage, or I call it bok choy. Here it's called pak choy. Uh, 371 milligrams. These are artichokes, the globe style. 370 milligrams. And here's an, another example, arugula. You'll find that in the spring mix of these baby greens. Um, 369 milligrams. So that's why it's better to choose those kind of green salads versus just the iceberg lettuce, which is uh, mostly water and the watered-down version of all these other good things. Squash, 350 milligrams. Broccoli, 343 milligrams. So if you can remember beans and dark leafy greens, uh, nuts and seeds, you get some. Actually, they didn't have the nuts and seeds mentioned mm -hmm. here, but the squash and pumpkins. 340 milligrams for pumpkins, watercress, beets, and finally, oh, I thought we'd get to bananas. Carrots, 320, broccoli, 316, endive, that's another baby green, rutabaga, cauliflower, okra, sweet corn, Anybody over 200 gets on this list because they're considered good sources. So we often hear about banana, but it didn't even make this list. It is about 200. But uh, there's so many other good choices that are of higher amounts. It looks like you can go over to another one. If you go down a little further, it says next. Oh, I see. The list might go on. You are correct. All right. So these are all good sources of potassium, and I would recommend getting your minerals that way because there's so many anti-cancer properties, uh, antioxidant properties, uh, natural fiber that promote health. It's, it's not just the potassium that we're focusing on, it's all the, the, the whole foods is what we want to portray here.
Um, what does fiber come from? All plants have fiber in it. It's in the wall of the cell. Uh, there's two kinds. The kind that can um, soak up water, we call it water soluble, and the kind that just sits at the bottom of the cup. What can she buy if she wanted to eat fiber? So what would be good? Well, it comes in buckets, but I would recommend fiber in the form of fruits and vegetables. All whole fruits and vegetables have fiber in it. If, if you peel the apple, you're peeling away a lot of the fiber that's in the apple. The, the peel has the fiber and nutrients. You're still getting some fiber. What about the breads? There's, if you're using whole grains, you're getting fiber. If it's a white bread, white flour, you're not getting the fiber. And, and so, whenever you can eat it more whole and unprocessed, you're going to eat more fiber in the process. That's the best way to get your fiber. If you find you're low on fiber, add things like dry prunes from the Costco, full of healthy water-soluble fiber, best laxative there is. Don't have to run to the vegetable. Dry vegetable um, fruits, don't they have, aren't they higher in um, potassium than fresh? Well, I think more in a way of measurements. Um, it's true, it's more concentrated, but if you were to hydrate them back to their natural size, it's going to be the same amount because you haven't added more potassium from anything. Okay. Yeah. So it's still another good source if you can't get fresh fruit. Uh, the frozen fruit, the dried fruit is a good source. All right. Well, we're going to have to um, wrap it up here. There's so much to, to learn about this subject, but by just adding these uh, foods, let's say you don't like the broccoli or the Brussels sprouts, you find one of the dark leafy greens that you do like. And uh, now it's easier to want to like them because you know it's helping blood pressure, it's helping your arteries be more dilated. Okay. Let's close with a word of prayer. Gracious Father, thank you again for helping us understand how our bodies are made and how we can have healthier blood pressures, reduce our risk for strokes and heart disease. May, may these uh, lessons be something we can add to our schedule this week so that we can move in the direction of better health. May your spirit live with us today and this week, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you.